Welcome everybody uh, to our second webinar of uh, 2021. This is part of our Muriel O'Brien speaker series. My name is David Shearer. I'm the executive director of Claremont Heritage and I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. We have a couple of very special guests and um, um, I want to just introduce them before we get started. Uh, and I'm going to introduce Alan Hess first. Um, many of you know who Alan is. Uh, he's an American architect, author, lecturer, and advocate for 20th century architectural preservation. Uh, he's a prominent California architecture critic who has written extensively um, on roadside strips according to the New York Times. And he's written and or co-authored uh, 20 books on architecture, numerous articles, um, subject matters like uh, Googie architecture, uh, Las Vegas architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright, Oscar Niemeyer, John Lautner, ranch houses, Palm Springs architecture, organic architecture, mid-century modern design in suburbia. And he's also been an ar the architecture critic for the San Jose Mercury News since 1986. So welcome, uh, Alan. Thanks, it's always great to be here with the Claremont Heritage because you have such great architecture there. <laughs> and Alan yeah, has uh, um, helped out with a number of our tours and things uh, and uh, been interviewed for uh, the film that the documentary did called Claremont Modern, which um, you can get uh, in the Claremont Heritage uh, online gift shop if you want to know everything there is to know about modern architecture in Claremont. Uh, and actually our, our speaker tonight, her name is Jana Ireland. She was born in Philadelphia in 1985. She lives in the greater Los Angeles area with her husband, sons, cat, and dog. And as a photographer, Jana aims to capture intimacy and relationships in her work and primarily focuses on black life in America. In her new book, Ireland turns her lens outward to showcase the legacy of barrier breaking architect, Paul R. Williams, and introduce his work to a larger audience. Um, I, should, I should mention that uh, we are celebrating uh, Black History Month with this uh, presentation tonight. And uh, in her book, Regarding Paul R. Williams, a photographer's view, artist John Ireland explores the work and legacy of Williams through a series of intimate black and white photographs. She gives the reader a vision of Williams that is both universal and highly personal. More than a book of architectural photographs regarding Paul R. Williams is the result of one artist's encounter with another, connecting across different generations within the same city. It's a collection of 280 photographs that celebrate the career of the first black licensed architect west of the Mississippi. His work helped shape the landscape of Los Angeles and brought good design within reach of all, regardless of race. He was known as Hollywood's architect and Paul Revere Williams was a Los Angeles native who built a wildly successful career as an architect decades before the civil rights movement. He designed municipal buildings and private homes as well as banks, churches, hospitals and university halls. He designed public housing projects and mansions for celebrities like Frank Sinatra and Lucille Ball. And in 1923, Williams became the first black member of the American Institute of Architects. In 2017, nearly 40 years after his death, he became the first black recipient of the AIA gold medal. Architecture as a subject wasn't necessarily a natural transition for Ireland, whose past work has primarily been portraiture but after learning about William's life, Ireland was drawn to telling his story. And I'd like to introduce Jana Ireland. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and for having me here. And a special thank you to Alan for being here tonight to help me out with this. I met Alan at the very first exhibition of this work back in 2017 
and this work has uh, just expanded my the people I know, my ideas about Los Angeles and my ideas about architecture exponentially. And Alan is one of those people who has uh, been pulled into my orbit or whose orbit I've been pulled into as a result of this book. So it's really great to have you here tonight. Thank you, Alan. So the book is called Regarding Paula Williams. This is what it looks like. And uh, as I mentioned, the first exhibition of this work was in 2017. So I've been working on it for several years. I'm gonna go through and read my introduction to the book, which talks a lot about um, the process of working on the project, but also some about Williams's life and add some context to the photographs that I'll be showing. The way that I organized the book and the way that I've organized this presentation is to be sort of experiential. So you're not seeing all photos from one house and then photos from another and then photos from another. It's organized in a way that kind of flows. So I'm looking at his, I guess I'm sort of looking at his entire body of work rather than looking at one thing at a time. So that's sort of the way the presentation is, is structured, which will make a little more sense when I start up again in a minute. And just to tell you a little bit about the title, the title is regarding Paul R. Williams. Um, my publisher came up with the title. We were trying to figure out what we could call the book and regarding Paul R. Williams seemed like such a great title because regarding means looking at and thinking about and talking about and having regard for. And it also allows the title to include the name Paul R. Williams, which was important. And the subtitle is A Photographer's View because I wanted to make it clear that I'm not an architectural historian. I'm not one of the members of his family who's done writing about him. I am an artist interpreting his work in my own way. So that is sort of supposed to be a clue about the kind of project this is and the, the work that I have done and, and continuing to do. I'm gonna jump into my presentation. Let me get it started. And after the presentation, what I will do is uh, we'll have a little moment where we'll bring Alan in and we'll, the two of us will talk. And then later there will be opportunities for you to ask questions. So if you have a question for me or for Alan, please put it in the Q and A. There's a little uh, button at the bottom that looks like uh, chat boxes and you can, can write in there. All right. Let me get this pulled up and get started. The essay is called The Architecture of an Icon. For the past several years, I've been photographing buildings designed by Paul Revere Williams, the legendary Los Angeles architect who practiced for 50 years and planned nearly 3,000 buildings. He was the first Black certified architect west of the Mississippi and the first Black member of the American Institute of Architects. In 2017, 37 years after his death, 44 years after his retirement, and 95 years after his induction to the American Institute of Architects, Williams became the first black architect to win the AIA gold medal, one of the highest honors in the field of architecture. My study of Paul R. Williams began in the summer of 2016 when Barbara Bester, a renowned architect in her own right, asked if I would be interested in photographing some of his buildings. She had gotten my name from my former professor, the exceptional photographer, James Welling. I jumped at the chance, even though Barbara was a stranger, Williams's name was only vaguely familiar and my knowledge of architecture was limited to a brief elective unit on Greek columns in sixth grade. At its core, my work is about the expression of black identity in American culture, and I felt an immediate connection to Williams's story. I am not an architectural photographer nor a documentary photographer. Most of my photographs are fictional scenes that relate to my own experiences. In Milk and Honey, for example, my husband, children, and I play alternate reality versions of ourselves carefully posed in my husband's grandfather's well-appointed mid-century house as though it were our own. When I said yes to Barbara that summer, 
I had no idea how to go about photographing a building, let alone dozens of them. What I did have was a one-year-old son and a brand new full-time administrative job at USC. I was struggling to figure out how I was gonna to continue to fit art into my life. As busy as I already was, I was happy to have a new assignment. That initial email from Barbara came at exactly the right time. A few months later, pregnant with my second son, I began my Paul Williams work. The decision to photograph in black and white was intuitive, almost automatic, and not tied to any sense of nostalgia for bygone eras. I simply wanted to mute distractions like the color of a wall or carpet and draw attention instead to Williams's voluptuous curves and tidy lines. Most architectural photography is designed to sell a space. It asks, what purpose does a building or room serve? What does it look like as a whole? My goal was to create an experience of Williams's work that was about the feeling of living in his spaces and loving them. Williams thought about every little detail and I felt that seeking out those details would be a fitting way to honor him. I searched for clues about Paul Williams and his buildings. Paul Revere Williams was born in 1894 to parents who moved from Memphis to Los Angeles for the promised curative properties of the climate. Both had tuberculosis and both were dead before Williams' fifth birthday. Williams and his older brother ended up in separate foster homes. The woman who raised Paul Williams recognized his potential and nurtured his skills. His artistic talents distinguished him from his peers throughout his childhood and he began his study of architecture as a teenager. When Williams was in high school, a teacher advised him that he'd never succeed as an architect. Black people wouldn't be able to afford to hire him and white people wouldn't deign to. This conversation was a major event in Williams' young life. By his own account, it had never occurred to him that race would complicate his professional choices. At this moment, many young people would have abandoned their dream as I very nearly did in a similar moment during my own high school career. 90 years later at the Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts. In my senior year, a teacher told me that I shouldn't apply to New York University, the school I'd fallen in love with, because it wasn't a place for people from humble beginnings. For a while, I believed him. The weight of a few words from an adult can be unbearable for a child. As Williams told it, his teacher seemed to think he was doing an unduly ambitious kid a favor by bringing him down to earth. I believe my own teacher thought he was doing the same. In both cases, the discouragement ultimately acted as a catalyst, not a deterrent. When I stopped being heartbroken, I was livid. I was 17 years old and at the top of my class. Who was this man to tell me I was overreaching? I sent in my application at the last minute and I went to NYU. Williams emerged from his own crisis with his commitment to architecture redoubled. His childlike ambition transformed into an adult's iron will to succeed. In I Am a Negro, his 1937 essay for American Magazine, Williams wrote of a drive that propelled him through the early years of his career. Quote, I wanted to vindicate every ability I had. I wanted to acquire new abilities. I wanted to prove that I, as an individual, deserved a place in the world. Williams went on to design municipal buildings, banks, churches, hospitals, motels, university halls, secondary schools, funeral homes, public housing projects, celebrity estates, and thousands of family homes. If you have ever spent an afternoon driving around Los Angeles, you have seen a Williams building or two. Williams' story is one I believe only could have taken place in Los Angeles. When he began his work as an architect in the 1910s, much of the Los Angeles we know today was a collection of dirt roads, farms, and oil fields. He officially opened his own office in 1923, right as the population of Los Angeles County reached 1 million. The booming city had three factors that allowed him to flourish. Lots of money, lots of land, and a handful of wealthy white people liberal or desperate enough to commission a young black architect. Subtract any one of those factors and his big story would shrink until it disappeared. Hancock Park provides a good example of how Williams' career developed. The neighborhood was established in the early 1920s while Williams was busy setting up his solo practice. He was given a chance to prove his worth with a series of commissions in this neighborhood though he could not have built his own home there. Hancock Park was protected by a 50 year restrictive covenant, ensuring that the only non-white people who could call it home were live-in servants. This was true of many of the cities and neighborhoods where Williams did his early work. After years of violence, LA's restrictive covenants were a kinder, gentler way to keep neighborhoods white. With these genteel restrictions in place, homeowners could take comfort in the knowledge that the undesirable population would stay where it belonged. 
Worried about Williams' impeccable work spread through Los Angeles' exclusive neighborhoods. In Hancock Park and Flint Ridge and Pasadena and Beverly Hills, one Williams home, and it was important to him that they be thought of as homes, not houses, became two, which became a dozen. By the time he retired in 1973, there were more than 2,000 Paul R. Williams homes in Southern California. Sometimes people who had seen his work and heard his name would come into his office, only to be shocked to find that he was Black. Some turned and left, but others stayed out of politeness. For these people, Williams taught himself a brilliant trick. He learned how to draw upside down. A skittish prospective client could be drawn in by the magic of watching the home of their dreams appear on the table in front of them without the impropriety of sitting next to a black architect. When I began my project, this and other stories about Williams' knack for turning indignities into triumphs intrigued me. How did it feel to design homes and neighborhoods where he wouldn't have been allowed to live? How did he unwind from the incredible stress of having to defer to people who would enjoy the benefits of his brilliance and labor without fully respecting him as a human being? When designing an intimate space for a client too prejudiced to shake his hand, did he view his work as a subversive act or something he had to do to survive? Williams' white contemporaries could find work by way of a signature style and the cult of personality. Williams had to work without ego, shifting to meet each client's demands. The result is a body of work that demonstrates incredible dexterity. Williams designed Monterey Colonials and Tudor Revivals and Modernist Bungalows. He could move deftly between historicist and contemporary styles and often found clever ways to blend the new and the old. He believed in designing to precisely suit the needs of each client and build his reputation by giving even his smallest commissions his full attention. Williams also believed in making good architecture accessible to all. In two books published in the mid-1940s, The Small Home of Tomorrow and its follow-up, New Homes for Today, Williams offered the average American dreaming of building their ideal family home dozens of floor plans to consider. With simple but evocative names like Sunshine Manor, Shangri-La Cottage, The Country Gentleman, and San Fernando, these plans were designed to be scaled up or down to meet the needs of different families. His work on public housing projects can be linked to his commitment to elevating his community and his belief that everyone deserves a dignified place to live. As the head of a team assembled by the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, Williams planned the Pueblo del Rio housing project in South LA in the early 1940s. In the early 1950s, Williams designed Watts's Nickerson Gardens, which remains the largest housing project in the West. Notably, Nickerson Gardens was a key site in both the Watts Rebellion in 1965 and the Watts Gang Truce, signed on April 28, 1992, the day before the officers who beat Rodney King were acquitted. The fates of Williams' structures vary. An untold number have been remodeled beyond recognition or destroyed. Most exist in a semi-altered state, some slowly run down by time, others well-kept with subtle additions and updates. The homes he designed for Frank Sinatra and Dave Chasen were raised, but the first AME Church and the Founders Church of Religious Science are still serving their communities. His Broadway Federal Savings and Loan Building burned down in 1992, but his Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Building still stands, now the headquarters of the South Central Los Angeles Regional Center. The La Concha Motel in Las Vegas is gone, but its lobby still stands as the visitor center of that city's neon museum. The long vacant Angeles Funeral Home Building in South Central LA has been transformed into an affordable housing development called the Paul R. Williams Apartments. In early episodes of the AMC television show, Fear the Walking Dead, Williams' Woodrow Wilson High School building appears as Paul R. Williams High School, a subtle nod from someone involved in the production. Williams' own Lafayette Square home is, at the time of this writing, in the process of being faithfully restored to its original glory. I'm happy to report that I'm not the only one doing work about Williams. The Paul R. Williams Project, run by the Memphis chapter of the AIA and the University of Memphis Art Museum, is currently at the forefront of Williams scholarship. Volunteers from the nonprofit organization U.S. Modernists are diligently combing through records, debunking false claims made by dishonest or willfully ignorant real estate agents, hoping to use Williams's name to add value to their properties. Organizations like Esoteric and Save Iconic Architecture spread the word about Williams as part of greater efforts to honor the history of Los Angeles. Royal Kennedy Rogers and Kathy McCampbell Vance's documentary film Hollywood's Architect tells Williams' a story in detail. The USC School of Architecture and the Getty Research Institute have recently acquired Williams' archives, 
opening the door for exciting new scholarship and research. And Williams's granddaughter, Karen Elise Hudson, has written books about her grandfather that are invaluable resources for those of us who treasure his work. The story of my work about Paul Williams is all tied up with my personal milestones. Learning to drive and learning Los Angeles by car, my pregnancy with my second child and lugging camera equipment and a big belly around strangers' homes, quitting my administrative job and beginning to teach photography, figuring out that I could be a decent mother and a committed artist at the same time. I learned a lot about myself doing this work and the work continues. It may continue until I can no longer manage a camera. When I look at Williams's meticulous designs, I'm reminded that there's no hurry. It took Williams more than 50 years to complete his work. Why shouldn't it take me just as long to study it? So far, I have photographed over two dozen Williams structures intimately and a few dozen more superficially from the street. The first Williams building I photographed, a handsome mid-century ranch style house in LA's View Park neighborhood, turned out not to have been designed by Paul Williams at all. I learned from the architect, Frank Escher, the house was designed by Claude Coyne, a partner at Paul R. Williams and Associates. By then, View Park number one, a dreamy picture of palm fronds leaning against a foggy plate glass window, had become the most widely distributed image from the project, appearing in Aperture and Harper's. Another photograph from the house had been printed in the Los Angeles Times. After much internal debate, I decided to keep the pictures from the View Park house in the body of work. That first shoot had set the tone for the rest of the project and the work had been done under the banner of the Williams name, if not by Williams himself. I continue to be stunned by the generosity of those whose homes I visit. So many people have given me so much of their time and attention. I'm grateful for the hours of labor performed and visible to me before my arrival. Floors scrubbed, mirrors polished, clutter tucked away. I'm thankful for the people I've come to know, the married pair of movie producers with a breathtaking art collection, the set of kindly Gen X lawyers with three kids and some amazing LA punk memorabilia, the college professor with a fascinating background in entertainment and politics, the granddaughter diligently tending to the family home. These people, house proud and justifiably so, welcomed me and let me see how they live. I spent two and a half years patiently waiting to be granted access to the home Williams designed for himself and his wife a sleek white international style house that resembles a futuristic riverboat run aground in the middle of Los Angeles. I gained entry to a house once owned by William Holden, later by Denzel Washington, when the current homeowner spied me through a window as I tried to take a clandestine picture from across the street. As soon as I said Paul Williams, his look of suspicion turned into one of warmth and understanding. I have scoured Zillow listings for Williams houses and cold called real estate agents. I've been introduced to property owners via friends of friends of friends. On several occasions, Williams's homeowners read about my work somewhere, sought out my contact information and invited me over. There are sites that turned out to be great disappointments and others that exceeded all expectations. There are also my white whale houses, UDC's owners I unsuccessfully quartered for months. I still hope to get to those someday. It is not the beauty of Williams's work that inspires me though it does bring me a lot of pleasure. It is the, the thought of him grinding day after day in the city, patiently building his practice and proving his detractors wrong that makes me return to his work. My photographs of Williams's building are as much a tribute to his labor and persistence as they are a tribute to his talent. I am proud to live and work in Paul Williams's city. If Williams could become one of the most notable architects of the 20th century here, what can my children become in the 21st? This is a fascinating time to live in Los Angeles, though I suppose that can be said of any moment in the city's history. A city can change so fast. Tracking Williams's work is my way of making sense of this sprawling, fascinating place I call home. Paul Williams was a faithful citizen of Los Angeles who used his abundant gifts to change the face of the city. Los Angeles has changed without him and will continue to change in unknown ways, but his mark is indelible. Los Angeles is known as a city that likes to forget its history but it will always remember Paul Revere Williams. So in my essay, I mentioned the fact that USC and the Getty jointly acquired his archives. And this was just announced last year, right before my book came out. And in the years since I started working on this project, 
um, the revival of interest in Paul Williams has just been incredible. He's someone who always had fans and people who are really devoted to his work, but for a long time, people weren't really talking about it. And it's only recently that people have begun talking about him in a way that uh, is putting him into conversation with other architects working in Los Angeles and talks about the work as something that really helped shape the city. Things that people had said before, but now more and more people are listening to it and are interested in it. And it's been really exciting to see all of these new projects and articles and just conversation about him and his work springing up in the year since I began, began working on this project. So I would like to invite Alan Hess to say some things to begin a conversation about this work. Alan. Yeah, it's just really great. I had to smile through a lot of your um, images. And I love the story about, you know, you're, you're hiding across the street trying to get a picture of a, one of the houses and people are suspicious, who is this? But then when, they, when there's this connection to Paul R. Williams, um, suddenly you're welcomed in. That wouldn't have happened, you know, a couple of decades ago, most probably, because he wasn't a, a, as well known. But it's just proof that now he is uh, a name which is getting out there, and certainly, um, uh, you know, deservedly so. Um, I guess I just need to say a couple of things myself about Paul Williams, if I may, because um, a lot of my career has been uncovering unknown or unheralded architects and types of architecture. And it's just exciting, but a pleasure to know that there's still things out there to be discovered. And um, we're just at that exciting time in Paul Williams uh, rediscovery. Um, it, it's just wonderful, you know, it's what history is about. It, history is now, really. Um, and there's so much to Paul Williams' career uh, that we're just beginning to piece together. And I'm really looking forward to um, what uh, the Getty and USC are gonna be doing with the um, archives uh, as well, um, mining that information so that we can piece together this story of Paul Williams, um, which again, you know, I hate to, you know, keep repeating this, but, it wasn't known when I was in architecture school at UCLA back in the uh, in the late seventies. Um, my one of my professors did you know point out a couple of Paul Williams buildings, so he, he wasn't completely forgotten. But he wasn't being taught in the courses or anything of that sort. This is you know a new revelation. But what I have been able to piece together of his career, just a skeletal framework. Um, is a real LA story. Um, it, uh, again, you know, he starts, he has all these obstacles to train himself, but clearly he has a real uh, uh, idea about what he wants to achieve. And he goes and gets jobs at the right architecture offices. Uh, people, architects like Reginald Johnson or Gordon Kaufman, who were sympathetic or enough to hire him and to train him. And those were great architects of, of the time. So he's learning, you know, architecture as it was then, which was mostly traditional styles. But then beginning in the thirties, uh, these modern ideas, there's a push to, you know, let's see what the 20th century has to offer. And Paul Williams is right there. Um, and uh, along with people like Douglas Honnold, one of my favorite architects, um, he creates this Hollywood Regency, which is a, a modern, modernized version of historical styles, but it's a move towards modernism. There's this spirit in the air here in Los Angeles. Um, and then after the war, basically, um, you know, he gets these other ideas about modern architecture and all of his skill and mastery from the traditional houses, these you know, big, beautiful houses in Beverly Hills and Flint Ridge and so forth, um, you still see that skill, but he has um, 
really in, in many ways invented a new type of modernism. It isn't Bauhaus modernism. It isn't international style modernism. Um, it isn't Richard Neutra modernism, but it is modern. It has a modern spirit to it. And he goes on from there. So just put together, that's just a really interesting story. And I'm really looking forward to somebody doing the hard work to put that all together uh, finally. Um, but uh, Johnny, your uh, photographs are going to be a, um, a great tool, um, I hope, for whoever puts that together. And so I wanted to ask you um, a question about that, looking at your um, uh, images here, um, black and white, so there's kind of a leavening or a leveling of, uh, of all of them. And what struck me just this evening is geometries, lines. Uh, whether he is doing modern lines, curved lines, um, Trigoresque lines, historical lines, uh, there is this um, an interest and a richness about the, the, the geometries, uh, which I, I see that you know you you've captured. Um, so I wanted to ask you, and again, this is valuable, I think, because you aren't an architectural photographer uh, or historian, and that's that's good. You're coming with a fresh eye. So uh, I wonder if um, is is that how one way that you approach your photography as a composition of lines, and that is why Williams is a particularly rich subject for you. I'm very interested in the way that he used lines, the way that different rooms came together or different doorways are set up and in just kind of in a lot of the photographs, really looking at those and really looking at that geometry and finding symmetry where I can or looking at things that are asymmetrical, which is deliberate and, and thinking about why that could be. And also the way light appears in many of these structures, the way the shadows appear at a certain time of day and the lines that those create as well. So did you, how long did you spend in these houses? I mean, through a day to see how the light changes? Some houses uh, I spent more time in than others. There were a couple that I had to do really quick, maybe one hour shoots in, but usually I spent three to four hours in one place. And I uh, last summer had the opportunity to photograph the Williams house in Ojai and they kind of get, said, well, what do you want to do? And I said that I wanted to come back a couple of times and see how the light changed throughout the day. So it's, it's something I'm interested in looking into uh, a lot more if I can. For me, for this project, the book project, scheduling it was always a challenge. So I could never really say I need to come in and see what the light is at this particular time. It was just sort of like, what time works for everybody? When can I get in? When does my husband have a chance to look after the children for a bit so I can go do some work? So I'd like to look at it in a more deliberate way for sure. Okay, interesting. So what you have, what are you focusing on for your future uh, excursions out to photograph? What are there other you know, new ideas you want to explore about? these buildings? I'm really interested in getting into the archive. We talked a little bit about it, or you talked about it, I talked about it. Um, the archive at the Getty includes a ton of his drawings. And I'm very curious about what looking at his drawings will, what ideas that will spark in me and in the scholarship that comes out of other people looking at his work and just the new ideas that will come out of the work. So the project doesn't feel done because there's so much more. The work is not going to stop being interesting to me. So I'm not going to stop looking at it, which means I'm not going to stop photographing it. So it's just sort of going on indefinitely, even though the book is out. Well, there's always a second book also that you can do. <laughs> maybe, maybe right. we'll see one day. Well, we do have, well, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alan. Well, no, are there questions coming in? We do, we do have some questions coming in, and, um, um, and, but feel free to jump in too and, uh, with answers or um, um, since you are the architectural historian and some of them might re refer to that. Um, so one of the questions was, I've heard that many of uh, Paul R. Williams archives went up in the fire that you mentioned. 
how much was preserved, if any, do you give a map guide that we could take and drive to view some of the work, his work? So which what I can we, answer the last part of that question, which is, I don't know that a map exists currently, but um, certainly Alan and I can work on that, <laughs> creating uh, that. Um, but the, the first part of the question was about the fire and how much was preserved, preserved. So for a long time, the rumor was that everything was lost. And that's what a lot of people thought for 20 plus years, for almost 30 years, really. But it turned out that what was really lost was mostly his office records. So we don't have a great way to track um, his payroll or what he was paid for jobs or who worked in his office or his side or the side rather the paperwork coming in from other architects and his correspondence with them. But what survived a lot of it seems to be drawings. And it's something that no one has really had a chance to look at yet. The drawings are all rolled up in over 500 tubes and each one is packed with material, but because of the pandemic, no one has been able to get into it and digitize it yet. So eventually all of that will be digitized and the archive will become public and anyone can go in and take a look at it and do their own research using it. And regarding a map, there are a few maps that have a few things, but usually a person will kind of approach the map making a map with their own ideas about what's interesting. So something that might be more useful to look for is something like um, on the site US Modernist, there is a list of homes that he designed. And on the uh, Paul R. Williams project site, which is from the University of Memphis Art Museum, they have a number of projects listed as well. So there are ways to create your own map or to take a tour, but it would be great if someone put together something really comprehensive. Um, and also, I would mention, of course, uh, the Gebhard Winter Guide to Los Angeles Architecture. Um, it uh, just had a new edition in the last couple of years, and um, it probably doesn't have all of Williams and a lot of the interesting uh, ones being discovered, probably not, but the main ones uh, should be in there as well to guide you to those. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I did want to just interject uh, with uh, um, one comment um, before we get to more questions. And that is that uh, Paul R. Williams did uh, do some uh, houses in Claremont. And the one in the behind me is one on 11th Street. And it's, uh, it's right out of the um, one of his books on small houses and modern houses that uh, I think he wrote in the mid 40s, something like that, right around like just post World War II, I think kind of for, you know, re people returning and when suburbia was kind of getting going and I don't know, Alan, maybe you can talk to that a little bit, but, um, but behind me and I'll move out of the way is an example of uh, a house here in Claremont. Yeah, David, do you happen to know anything about the original owner or was it a, a spec house? Uh, do you know any of that? I believe the original owner was a doctor and um, I, I don't think it was a spec house. I think it was um, built for this uh, particular individual. I don't have the history right in front of me, but, um, but I, I believe that is the uh, story. And if uh, the, the current owners are watching, please, um, if you have more information, put it into the, uh, the Q&A and um, I, can, I can convey that. Yeah. Oh, that, that's good. I'm really glad that you're uh, out there in Claremont or you know, putting together that part of the story uh, that will be helpful to the whole thing. I just say about this house that, um, again, I would guess it's from the 1950s. Um, and uh, it's this kind of moderate modernism. It has flat roofs. It has no uh, historical uh, ornament per se. Uh, but you know the asymmetry of the uh, the central uh, doorway and the two wings and so forth, an abstract geometric composition. These are all thing parts of Williams' uh, own personal evolution of modern ideas. I just put up. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the the top is the a drawing from the book. 
of this house. Move out of the way here. Do you, do you but, know the name of that particular floor plan so I can look it up? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I can. I should have had that ready to go, but uh, um, yeah, it. It, um, it is in, I think it's in the um, Book of Small Houses, I believe. Those books are really neat if anybody yeah. wants to look at them. They've been um, republished um, so that you can, you can, you know, you can buy them now. Oh, um, someone says it's the Miami. That's good to know. Thank you. Okay, we have some, somebody, good, okay. Um, let's go to another question. Um, uh, someone's asking, one photo near the beginning of the exhibition was a glass building with tall, dramatic white arches over the windows. Can you tell us more about this project and was it a successful building? I they think that the building that you're describing is the lobby of the La Concha Motel. Um, and you ask if it's a successful building. What's interesting about that particular structure is that the motel closed, but the lobby was moved down the street and is now the lobby of the Neon Museum there. So I would say that in a way the building was unsuccessful because the business failed, but the building itself uh, is a success in that it's still at least partially standing and is a point of interest and people go uh, to take their wedding photos in front of it because it's so neat looking. Well, the the business failed on the, one of my books was on the Las Vegas Strip and it's just because of the incredible pressure to develop the Las Vegas Strip. A tiny little motel like that was no longer uh, viable. So they built some huge mega hotel on this site. But I would like to point out that um, uh, there are several uh, Williams buildings in Las Vegas and in Reno, as well as uh, Washington DC and South America and other places. But um, there's a great deal of interest in Las Vegas and Reno in Paul Williams. They are working to save his buildings that exist there. And all of us you know, in the great Southwest uh, can uh, uh, participate in this effort to uh, bring Paul Williams recognition back. Oh, that's great. Didn't he do the um, Arrowhead Springs Hotel? Yeah, Is with uh, Gordon did? Kaufman. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, and and I know he did some some uh, homes or condos or something or that are now condos in uh, Lake Arrowhead, which uh, some a lot of Claremonters go there. Mm. Um, mm. Another question. Uh, beautiful photographs, Jana. Any intention behind choosing to display the images in black and white? Was color ever considered for certain Williams buildings? That's uh, question one. And then the second question, if, oh, if I may, have you been able to photograph the Arrowhead Springs Resort, which is one of uh, this uh, uh, viewer's favorite buildings by Williams? I think it was Alan who a few minutes ago described black and white as a kind of leveling, which is what I was trying to do because he worked, uh, his practice was open from 1923 to 1973. So that's 50 years in practice and all working in all of these different architectural styles and taste changing throughout his career. And then after his death, as the buildings continue to be modified and all of that, there are just so many factors, so many um, wallpapers and carpets and couches and things that are really interesting to look at, but that I thought would distract from really looking at the architecture in the photographs. So shooting in black and white was a way to kind of flatten all of that out and just look at the architecture itself. And as for the second question, I have not been to the Arrowhead Springs uh, Resort. There are just, there are too many places. I would love to get to as many as I can. Maybe one day I'll get up there. John, I wonder, do people ask uh, you uh, the same questions about your book? Um, is there you know, something particular that people are attracted to, a, a building or a photograph that, you know, particularly you've gotten a lot of attention for in the book? 
people ask the question about black and white a lot. That's one that I get just about every time I do a presentation. And it's a funny question to me because when I started the project, it was like, yes, it makes sense to be in black and white for this reason. So it feels, it's uh, it's one of those questions that the answer feels so natural to me. And I have to remember not everyone is do is seeing things exactly like you are. So you have to figure out how to explain this to other people. Um, and in terms of individual photographs, there are a few that keep coming up again and again, but really people have uh, different tastes. People are interested in different things. Sometimes people will be interested in everything from one building, or sometimes people will be interested in just the really abstract ones. So I found that there are things in it that attract different kinds of people. That's good because that's the, the variety in his work. It's also one of the things that uh, kept him from being uh, a well-known architect because like Neutra had a style, Frank Lloyd Wright had a style and it was instantly recognizable. But with an architect like him who was always exploring new uh, directions, which is perfectly legitimate for mm -hmm. a good architect, um, it, it, yet it, it doesn't establish that one uh, image that everybody knows the name of. So uh, just the nature of architectural history. Yeah, I, I did wanna just make one uh, interesting note on the uh, Arrowhead Springs Hotel, which I believe is currently owned by the San Manuel uh, Band of uh, Indians uh, uh, and that they are um, intending to, to restore it. Um, I just found out this week that actually the San Manuel Band of Indians has invested in a building here in Claremont um, on the college campuses and they're partnering with CGU, the Claremont Graduate University to uh, restore the Huntley Bookstore wow. by A. Quincy Jones and uh, Frederick Emmons um, to, into a wellness center. So that is extremely good news. This was a building that was um, in a master plan to be torn down at one point and um, Claremont Heritage uh, kind of made them aware of, uh, the college is aware of the significance of this building. It's the only A. Quincy Jones, Frederick Emmons uh, uh, building on, on the college campuses here. And so, but that's, it's interesting that this, uh, you know, group of Native American uh, people group is is actually helping to preserve some of our significant architecture. So I think that's just wanted to add that. Oh, that's really uh, encouraging to hear. Yeah. yeah. Say, so David, I'd like to put in a plug here now because uh, John and I did a, um, a conversation, a video conversation for Palm Springs Modernism Week, which is going on right now online. And um, if uh, any in our audience would like to uh, go into some other areas that we talked about in that. Uh, you can go to uh, modernismweek.com, uh, the website, and uh, the uh, title of the talk is regarding Par Paul R. Williams, the photographer of Jana Ireland. Um, and you can find that. The tickets are $15, but um, uh, beautifully photographed in a Paul Williams house. Uh, so um, it'll give you a, a broader idea as well. So please check that out. Yeah, it's 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 really good. I I've, I've seen it. Um, well, we've got a few minutes left. Let's uh, let me go to a couple more questions. Um, uh, viewer asks: Given the climate in which Williams worked, what difficulties did he have retaining contractors? In some of his writing, he does talk a little bit about doing things like walking with his hands behind his back at a construction site because not all of the construction workers would have been willing to shake his hand or not all of the contractors. But in terms of the people who worked for him, that's one of those questions that I have about his work or rather the people he collaborated with, the builders, the roofers. I know that there are people that he worked with uh, several times and I'm hoping that part of what emerges from looking at his archives is people figuring out more about that kind of thing, piecing more of that together. That's one of those things I don't, I don't know enough about. Well, and on that line also, um, I, I, I'm still disappointed that a lot of his office papers were apparently lost uh, because there was 
apparently a whole infrastructure of uh, people who finance the buildings. A lot of his houses were speculative houses. So somebody had to put up the money first to build it and they hired Paul Williams. Um, who were those people? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just how did he run his office? How big was it? And who did he hire? And what names should we be exploring? You mentioned uh, Claude Coyne, uh, but there are other architects, uh, African-American architects like Robert Kennard and um, Art Silver and others who had some relationship. We don't know, uh, but there's a whole story there that'll unfortunately take a little bit more digging, but um, uh, I'm sure the Getty can do that. <laughs> A lot of it, I think, will be figuring out whose archives to look in and then looking for their half of the correspondence in their archives and maybe trying to work work that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John, I wanted That's to good. ask, I'll, go ahead. Is there, do you have a question there, David? Um, no, go ahead, Alan. I, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, and one of the uh, areas that uh, we went into in our Modernism Week um, uh, uh, conversation was some of his clients um, who were entertainers. And we talked a bit about uh, Al Jolson uh, and Paul Williams designed his, uh, his uh, memorial, his grave, grave memorial at the cemetery, um, Hillside Cemetery. Uh, but he also designed a house for um, um, oh, Charles Carell, that's right, who was one, it was, part of the Amos and Andy show. Uh, and of course, both Al Jolson and Amos and Andy performed in blackface. And this is in the, you know, the 30s and 40s, 50s, you know, uh, very, very successful, both of them. And Paul Williams worked with them, designed for them, especially this memorial, which can still be seen. It's quite uh, noticeable at the curve of the 405 uh, or yeah, the 405 in uh, Culver City, you'll see the cemetery off to the north and there's this round Tholos form. That's the memorial to Al Jolson, one of the most obvious, uh, notable uh, monuments to any Hollywood star. And it's by Paul Williams and it's for Al Jolson. And you had some interesting insights into that and into that period uh, of, Paul Williams were doing great work for these architects or for these uh, entertainers. Uh, well, my theory, well, with Al Jolson, he was someone who was Jewish. He was an immigrant. He was, he was from uh, Lithuania. So he had the experience of feeling like an outsider. And he also, I think, saw himself as an ally to black people and saw his work in blackface as a tribute so we look at it today and it's sort of painful to look at, but thinking about um, what it meant to him and how other people saw it at the time, it, it's a totally different thing. It's, it, it's not the same as a contemporary black architect designing for a contemporary entertainer who put on blackface. The, every, the conversation has just changed around it so much. Let me get to another question. Um, someone's asking if Williams had ever met Julian Abel, the African-American architect who designed Beaux Arts mansions in Newport, Rhode Island, New York City, Duke University buildings, et cetera. I don't know if either of you know the answer to that. I have never seen anything that indicated that they met, but for the, I'm not sure when, Abel died. I don't know how far into Williams's career that would have been, but certainly Williams would have been aware of him and his work, I would guess. And I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Philadelphia, that which is a city that he is very connected to. So I'm curious about his work as well. Um, another question. Um, well, I'm going to combine two questions. One is regarding uh, Jana, the Paul Williams' variant architectural styles had an impact. Did they have an impact on your personal uh, photography style or your art art style? That's one question. And then um, someone else asked if there are if you're selling prints of any of these images, if there might be available for purchase. 
Documents are available. Uh, you can email me. My email address is easy to find. If you can spell my name, it's just, uh, if you go to johnireland.com, it's my website, there's contact information there. Um, and in terms of whether the architectural styles have had an impact on my personal style, I wouldn't say any one thing in particular, but when I began this project, the way that I was working was mostly doing these really carefully staged portraits with lights. So beginning this work where I was walking into completely unfamiliar spaces was a really freeing way to work. So I think it changed. I think doing having this experience of again and again, going into inf unfamiliar places and trying to figure out how to make something that works in these spaces has influenced the way that I do my other work and has probably influenced the work that I'm doing now, which is largely about my family stuck here at home for the past year. Uh, I had a question. Go ahead. Um, have you met any of William's original clients or Anybody who personally knew him or, or maybe the family, but anybody else? I have not. The closest I came was um, visiting a house and photographing it right after the original owner who was uh, who knew Williams died. Mm -hmm. So I've met some people who say their grandparents knew him, for example. I've met several people whose grandparents knew him, but no one who who knew him. Wow. I mean, other than people in his own family, that is no no people living in his houses. Yeah, yeah. There was a comment, um, something about uh, 10250 West Sunset Boulevard, um, something that Williams designed in 1939, has 60 rooms and is currently owned by a fashion designer. Um, and I, and the, pers the person commenting said that the owner was surprised that um, the commenter knew who designed their home. Uh, did, you, did you happen to photograph that? It's an estate at uh, Sunset Boulevard, West Sunset Boulevard. I did not photograph that home, but I would say that maybe by now the owners have noticed that there's a lot of chatter about this architect and that that's really, um, as I said, in the past few years, really changing. And we talked a bit about preservation in Nevada, but here there's kind of a problem where someone will knock down a Williams house and then just sort of say, oops, sorry, I'll pay the fine and then I'll build whatever I wanna build. So my hope is that um, increasing awareness of this helps increase those, helps make preservation efforts more successful and make sure that more people who live in his homes know that they have something really special. Yeah, just getting that word out there. A couple of years ago, I was involved with uh, making a uh, Los Angeles City landmark of a house in Brentwood, uh, a Paul Williams house, uh, a landmark. And uh, it was just at the last minute, the bulldozers were there ready to um, uh, push it down. And the neighbors who actually also lived in um, uh, a Paul Williams house, and uh, we're very big in the entertainment industry. Um, saw it, called up City Hall, got the bulldozers stopped, and we went through the process of uh, uh, landmarking it as well. Um, uh, it was a, a smaller house, I guess if I remember before, a widow, a, a kind of ranch style house, but beautiful Paul Williams details on it. So that is when we saved, but as you know, as you point out, it's everybody kind of being aware of it and conscious of it and um, uh, appreciating these buildings that, well, it's the only thing that'll keep them going. Um, I don't have any more uh, questions from the group. Um, oh, um, someone did uh, say that uh, Abel died in 1950, mm -hmm. if that helps at all, but um, I also wanted to let um, people know that your book is available on our website, um, claremontheritage.org, and you can go to the shop there and, uh, and purchase this wonderful book. It's, it's amazing, um, I mean, be just beautifully done. And, um, but uh, any kind of last uh, comments? I, I, what you were saying about preservation, Jana, I think was very, important and um, something that, uh, you know, this work 
really helps to, uh, like Alan said, raise awareness and bring people to the realization that um, that these buildings do has, have significance and they have a story and that story needs to be told. But uh, any kind of uh, uh, words to, to wrap things up? And, uh, and Alan, I don't know if you have something that you wanna say, but. Well, I would just repeat uh, one thing that uh, John mentioned in her talk. Um, Paul Williams is an LA architect. Um, there's so many aspects of Los Angeles's history, culture, um, uh, the evolution of architectural ideas, the openness to new ideas that are really pretty much unique to Los Angeles. So um, he's really important to understanding uh, the whole history of architecture in Los Angeles as well as his own. That's a great point, Alan. I guess I would just like to say thank you again to everybody. Yes, yeah, thanks thank to you. Heritage. Yeah, thank everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, um, hopefully you've uh, gained some, some new scholarship in, uh, to one of the architects that uh, did uh, work here in Claremont and uh, in many other places. And, uh, and uh, please uh, stay tuned for the, the next uh, the next uh, speaker series that will be uh, the it's the fourth Thursday of every month. So next month it'll be I think on the twenty fifth, I believe. Good. But with that, um, and thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jana, for your uh, your help tonight, and um, wish everybody a great evening. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.